Finding inspiration through Fife folklore. The BioWriters would like to thank the writers involved in this project, Sandra Ireland for delivering the writing workshops, Sheila Kinnemanth for delivering the storytelling skills workshop, Fife Council Culture Grants for funding the printing of the chapbook, Scottish Book Trust for live literature funding for the writing workshops, St Andrew's Heritage Museum and Garden for hosting our event on Wednesday 15th of June. Year of Stories for promoting our event and for funding the Storytelling Skills Workshop. A House with the Legs by Sebastian Taylor. It has been years since I set foot in this town. Things have changed, lots of things have changed, but the coast especially is different. The sand has moved imperceptibly, the horizon slightly shifting, where the difference creates a slope that wasn't here before. The faces change too, though not nearly as much as I would expect. Not nearly as much as I would hope. It has been good to see friends. Everyone seems different though, and we all slip into our old roles. I've been staying with a friend while I'm here, and yesterday we went for a late evening walk along the beach. Between us we shared a bottle of ginger wine. It's not usually my thing, but it guarded us against the cold that crawled in off the surf. It was getting late, the sun dipping below the horizon. I remember seeing a handful of dog walkers dotting the sand in front of me. My friend joked, You know, I heard there are always at least three dogs being walked on this beach at any one time. Oh yeah? I responded. Why is that? Obviously, the dogs guard against the hound coming in off the surf. They really haven't changed. I love it. So I humoured them. What's this hound? Why do we need to be guarded against it? My friend, who has clearly had too much wine, giggled. It's a huge hound, obviously, and it lives in the mist and sea spray that comes off the waves. And, uh, well, it's scary, obviously. I couldn't resist teasing them. It's a big hulking beast, and it's scared off by that little Yorkshire terrier snuffling up the beach up there. That set us right off, it did. But here, I was reminded of this one time. I woke up. This was years ago. My flatmate downstairs must have been making noise because it was far too dark for my alarm to have gone off. It wasn't the first time she'd woken me up with music, laughing, and loud thumping coming from the ground floor. I had not been sleeping well and her constant partying had not been helping with the insomnia. I decided to get up and maybe ask her to quiet down a bit. I trudged down the stairs, hoping the noise set a stone tone, but when I forcefully yanked open the door into the living room, it's a surprisingly heavy door, I realised I hadn't seen any lights on. No sign of my flatmate, no sign of partying or debauchery, or even late night snacks. And the room was cold. This was surprising because, although the nights maintained that lingering spring cold, the house held the heat well. You remember it was the envy of your friend's accommodation, which ranged from drafty, haunted old turrets to brittle, freezing new builds. This town is such a mishmash of architecture. Thick stone walls interfaced with fishermen shanty projects, preserved in dry wool and a new lick of paint. My house was one of the new builds. Sturdy and warm, it kept the heat in the winter and the cold in the summer. As for ghosts, the only thing haunting it seemed to be the long line of previous tenants. Their letters always arrived ceremoniously through my post box. But it was a good house. And yet the living room was cold that night. I started to feel panic prickling my neck as I strode into the room to see if my flatmate was sitting in the propped open door through by in the connecting kitchen. The sodium lamps they used in that part of town illuminated the orange rectangle of the open door on the other side of the gloomy room, but I couldn't see anyone on the step. I rushed to see if they were just in the wee concrete courtyard, but there was no one there, not a soul. This is when I really did start panicking. I rushed back into the house, knocking on my flatmates' doors, waking them up and dragging them out of bed. The three of us searched the house top to bottom to make sure nothing and no one had gotten in. Despite a combined search, nothing seemed out of place. After some cups of tea and some reassuring chats, we managed to rationalise that the door was left unlatched and blew open in the night. We were all visibly shaken, and none of us slept well that night. A few days passed. I'd quickly been distracted by work, by study, by hay fever, by all manner of things. 
I seemed to move so quickly then, quicker than I do now. It felt like this was when most of my life was lived. So many things happening in such a short amount of time. So many things. For example, there was that time I was coming home late from work. The salon, rather old for a salon around here, was converted so well as to obscure what might have been there before. And I passed a row of buildings I knew very well. As part of the commute home, I would know these houses, even subconsciously. I knew their outlines in the dark, the smells that fluctuated from pasta water to brine to laundry to fresh rubbish. I knew the section patrolled by a local tomcat and the endless scaffolding that blocked out the moonlight or protected my head from the rain. And yet this one particular night, there was a gap. It was so improbable as to have escaped my immediate perception, so I had to double back to investigate the gap in the walls, a void between two of the unremarkable yet familiar flats. The ground was covered in grass and rubble and shrubs, as if it had been a vacant lot for years. I just couldn't understand what I was looking at, and as I marvelled at what should have clearly been a building, I felt the gaze of someone behind me. Whipping round, I saw there, across the street, a woman with a stern face and a stiff frock. A cloud passed overhead and uncovered the moon. In that pale light, her face shone, and the wrinkles around her bright eyes told a story. A story of hot cobblestones, a story of thick rope and hands rough from its re weaving. A story of a large family, the story of joy, of having peace from the street and from the heat and from the children. It was the story of another life. It was all the pain, all the joy, all the petty dramas, all the small mercies. Then it was too much for me. And I reeled, teetering back, I fell against the wall of the house that was an empty lot. Sure enough, I turned, placed my hands on the pebble dash, and pressed until it mottled my palms. When I finally recovered from this realization, I realised the woman was gone. Anyway. I visited the building I seem to have misplaced all those years ago this morning. To my surprise, it has been reduced to rubble. A pile of stone and wood, shrubs and rebar, stretching between the adjoining houses. I stood for a while on the other side of the safety barriers, with slipping my hand through one of the cracks to make sure it really was gone. I grasp nothing. But, through the cracks, I thought I could catch a glimpse of something moving. It seemed like it was an old lady picking through the wreckage. It has been years since I set foot in this town. I think it will be years before I return again. My hands were dirty from planting daffodils during a green gym volunteering session at Cambo, and then going on to my painting class in the local Kings Barnes Village Hall. It had been a long day and I was relieved to sink into the heated leather seat of a lift home, offered from one of the painting ladies, who would be driving into St Andrews past my cottage on her way to the library. The alternative was hanging around for half an hour in the chilly air, waiting for the friendly 95 bus. She was a farmer and chatty about the ploughing, her grown up children and the vulnerability of having loud parties of young people drinking all night on the sandy cove by the ruin of the salmon bothy at the bottom of her isolated farm. My ears pricked up when she mentioned that they used to own Pit Millie Farm and I encouraged her to expand as I had heard rumours of ghostly goings on there. She stopped the car just opposite the abandoned walled garden and the site where the large house of Pit Millie had once stood. Yes, she said. It was a good few years ago and she had been busy sorting out furniture and things belonging to the house in view of them being taken away for sale the following day. She had returned tired to her own house at the end of that day. 
sitting at the well-worn wooden kitchen table, passed down from her grandmother to her mother and then to her, drinking her tea with her legs stretched comfortably out on another chair in front of her cosy stove. She explained to her husband and his friend who had just dropped by that she was worried about leaving all the things in the empty house overnight for security reasons. Furthermore, there was no way she was going to be there overnight, not with all the whispered half stories of she didn't quite know what. Oh, that's nothing, said the confident and worldly friend, who was an ex-soldier and a big, strong man. OK, then you spend the night there, joked the husband. Unable to pass up an opportunity of proving himself, the friend did just that. Later on, after a meal and a glass of whiskey, he took a sleeping bag, a torch, a few snacks and a book. See you in the morning. He shut the door and strode off into the cold night, stomping over a few fields to the deserted house. I'm glad it's not me, the lady said, wondering how the soldier would fare. Oh, he'll be fine, replied her husband. Well, I noticed you didn't offer to accompany him. It was getting late and off they went to bed. The full moon shining high and small and golden in the frosty air. Early the next morning, they were surprised to find the friend sitting at the table, staring fixedly in front of him his stubbled face grey and drawn, his eyes rimmed red. The fire had died down to soft ashes and the collie was curled tightly in her basket. They couldn't get out of him what had happened, except he had left as quickly as he could at about two o'clock in the morning, his heart beating fast and had sat in the cold farmhouse kitchen in a stupor until the couple had come down. I'm never going in there again, was all he would say. The house has since been demolished. Hello there, so I am Matea Grenentz and I will be reading through the three poems that I've composed for the project. Obituary of an Anstruther Bookshop Owner The spark of a match, and it all goes incumbently, The silhouette of loss departed and packed away. Sensations are not crafted to last, not binding. When the bookshop creaks at midnight, they are your footsteps, Your absence across the sea translated into terrible presence, And I know that love is jealous. So the story behind that, um, in the 1800s, a woman in Anstruther mourns her lover thought to be lost at sea. Before he left, they had promised themselves to each other, swearing never to part. One grim afternoon, she receives a report of his death in a violent and sudden storm. However, this account is false. A body was wrongly identified, and he has actually survived, unbeknownst to her. The lover returns months later after attempting to regather his fortune to woo her, and he finds that she has married someone else. He is consumed by rage and attempts arson of her bookshop before walking into the sea, weighed down by stones. After his death, the bookshop begins to be haunted by strange phenomena. Books will sometimes tempestuously fly off of the shelves, floorboards will creak as if someone is pacing, or visitors will inexplicably smell smoke. The Spare Room by George McDermott are you sure about this? He stood in the centre of a small living room, hands in pockets, and, for some inexplicable reason, scanned the ceiling as if the measures of the place could be found somewhere in the corner. Like, of course I am, I replied, as I dumped the first box on the table by the door, wondering why he hadn't carried anything in. It's exactly what I was looking for. He raised an eyebrow at that and moved his unimpressed gaze around the walls. Where'd you want the stuff dumped? I gave him a short tour. The house was pretty much as symmetrical as you could get, with the corridor leading from the living room passing a small central bathroom. 
Oh, pink, lovely, he grinned, before passing the foot of a short, steep stairway and entering the ground floor bedroom, door directly opposite from where we had come. Most of the stuff is going in here, I said. No point humping it upstairs where it all probably would remain in boxes until I move again, though there is a small cupboard up there. Should I wish to move things out of the way, I continued, adding, should I have visitors? A comment that heard nothing more than a desultory shrug of the shoulders, along with an undecipherable grunt. We then climbed the steep steps to a very similar corridor, parallel to the one below, but with a railing the length of it so you could look down. This linked a bedroom directly to our right, above the room where I was to store all my stuff. A small central cupboard above the bathroom, and another bedroom at the other end, which was above the living room. He banged his head on the sloping roof almost immediately on entering the first upstairs room, though the view from the small dormer window was to his liking. At least I thought so at first. Good views from here. You can see... He paused. Absolutely nothing for miles. I sighed. He'd always been the comedic sibling, so you just got used to his sorry comments and ignored them as best you could. This is the main bedroom, I declared, opening the final room and going in. It was pretty much identical to the other upstairs bedroom. The same sloping wood-lined roof, the same dormer window with a very similar view over quiet farmland. To me, however, it was cosier, and being directly above the living room, I assumed it would benefit from the warmth of the room below. All my clothes and personal stuff are going in here. We can just dump them all on the bed and I'll sort them out later. His hands had gone back into his pockets as he walked around the room, somewhat bent due to the mismatch between his height and the height of the ceiling, inspecting it carefully. And you're sure? he asked again. I mean, you could probably get a place in town somewhere closer. No, I interrupted. I want the peace and quiet. I like solitude. It's over a month until term starts, and the idea of complete isolation appeals to me, especially before lesson plans and the responsibility of the future of a hundred kids falls into my hands. This is out with the catchment area, I added, before he could say whatever it was he was going to say, so when term starts, it's somewhere where I can escape to where no one will know me. I looked at him, confidently, I thought. He looked back down to me. OK, your funeral, he shrugged, and with that, walked out to the van and started bringing boxes in. He wouldn't stay for anything to eat. A cup of tea, even. And though, to be honest, I had no idea where any of that was at the moment. He said something about the van having to be returned and it being a long drive back to civilization. Christmas was the extent of his dialogue when he hugged me to say goodbye, and I agreed, probably. I watched as the van slowly disappeared out of sight and I was left completely alone. Over the next few weeks, I got into a routine. I took morning walks along the old track up to the edge of the forest where an abandoned house now provided a home to cattle, their lazy heads poking out from the windows. An outside toilet had at some time given birth to a magnificent tree which spiralled out its open doorway and reached for the sky, providing a perfect spot for a rather large rookery which sprung into a raucous life whenever I approached. I enjoyed going up there, just taking it all in. I also got great views of my little farmhouse from up there, sitting all alone with its blackened and broken down barns, hugging a little cobbled courtyard. When I felt mel melancholy, as I did on occasion, especially as term time got closer and closer, wondering if this really was the right career move, I found myself drawn to the upstairs spare bedroom, I'd sit for hours at the small window and just stare over the fields. I felt comforted there, and more than once I quickly scanned round the room, feeling sure I'd seen something, or felt someone there, watching. It was a nice feeling, though. Even that one time, I was sure I'd felt a small hand on my shoulder. Clearly I'd imagined it, but for a brief second it felt very real. The lightest of a soft touch on my shoulder, a gentle reassuring squeeze. I then found myself curled up on a small chair, reading, but positioning my book such that, if anyone really was behind me, they could look over my shoulder and read along with me. A week before term was due to start, I got a surprising call from Jake and Miranda, who wanted to come and visit. 
Now, I'd met Jake at uni. We'd managed to remain friends since Miranda, on the other hand. She'd appeared at a party one evening in Edinburgh and just seemed to have always been around ever since. They'd been a couple for nearly a year now, and I was never convinced they were well suited. I decided to put them in the upstairs bedroom. The downstairs one still being full of junk and had no inkling to take any of it upstairs to store it away in a small, dark and, I'd imagined, damp cupboard. I decided to light a fire to give the room a warm cosiness I thought might be welcome. I set it as I would any fire and lit it. It didn't take, so I tried again, a little more paper this time. The paper burned, but the kindling wouldn't take. Now I had some fire layer somewhere, so I sought them out and tried again. Trouble striking the matches now. After about four failed attempts, I managed to get one going and to get the fire lighter started. However, as soon as I did, I felt such a chill I involuntarily shivered across my arms, rubbing them for warmth. As I crouched down in front of the fire, I could see my breath, which startled me somewhat. I looked around the room carefully, feeling as though I was being watched again, though this time, it didn't feel quite as comforting as the feeling it had before. And then the fire lighter, normally impossible to extinguish once lit, fizzled out. I stood up and looked around, feeling as though I'd done something wrong. On my final attempt to get the fire going, after maybe half an hour of failed attempts, I swear I felt a chill air over my hands as I tried to strike the match, as though something, or someone, was blowing cold air over them. It left my breath hanging in a small, wispy cloud as I decided I had no time to get the fire going before Jake and Miranda arrived. It had been a good thought, but a fire wasn't really needed, I decided. I made a mental note to speak to the landlord about possibly checking out the chimney. It was lovely to see them both. I took them up to the room so they could leave their bags and they could get their bearings. Oh, wow! Miranda exclaimed as she squinted out the window. You weren't kidding, were you? Jake flopped out on the bed. Delightful, darling. I see the maid has prepared the fire for us. He grinned up at me, lying on his back, hands behind his head. You can light it later, if you like, I said, wondering if it would work for them. I'm not really sure you'll need it, though. I looked at the fireplace, feeling a little uneasy. All I wanted now was to go back downstairs and open a bottle of wine. Miranda read my mind. I'll keep you warm, my love, the only fire you'll need. Throwing her hat at Jake, who flinched when it hit him full in the face. Meanwhile, we're going downstairs to open a bottle of wine and do some catching up. She grabbed me by the arm and led me downstairs, chatting incessantly the whole time, until finally the first sip of wine caused her to pause for breath. Jake appeared a moment later. I think I got the fire going. Use most of the box of matches, but the room will be warm and cosy in no time. He looked at each of us. Well, I'm thirsty as well, you know. After a lovely evening of good food, good company, perhaps a little too much to drink, we retired to bed. At the top of the stairs, I left him to go into the room while I wandered along to mine. Just as I was closing the door, I could hear Jake. Ah, oh, bloody hell! I was sure I'd got that bloody thing going. Looks like it hasn't even started. There then followed comments and noises from Miranda that I decided it was best not to listen to, so I closed my door quietly and climbed into bed. I woke suddenly in the early hours of the morning to the sound of a scream. It was terrifying. Miranda? I jumped out of bed and ran along the corridor to the spare room and knocked. Jake? Miranda? Is everything OK? The door opened and Miranda ran out pushed past me and headed down the stairs, dressed only in a long baggy t-shirt. It's okay, it's okay, Jake appeared, hastily tying a dressing gown and started down after her. It's just a nightmare. Don't worry, I'll see to her. Please, please go back to bed. I was left alone at the top of the stairs, facing the door, which was slightly ajar. Something felt wrong. This room, which had been my comfort for many weeks, now felt threatening, menacing. I imagined shadows moving within and it frightened me. I turned and walked back to my own room, but when I started to close my door, I glanced back. There now seemed to be a flickering coming from the room, which I hadn't noticed earlier. Had Jake managed to get the fire lit after all? 
The door closed by itself slowly. Probably a draft, I thought. I slept uneasily until my bladder finally decided it was time to get up. As I passed the spare room, I felt uneasy, rushing past it, trying not to look at the door, and was glad when I reached the bottom of the stairs. By the time I got to the living room, Jake and Miranda were already dressed, and packed. You're leaving? Jake looked awkward. So sorry, but Miranda has this thing. My sister is arriving tomorrow from Florida, and I really wanted to be there, Miranda interjected. I just got a text. I didn't know she was going to be so early. Jake mouthed, sorry, from just out of sight, and motioned he'd come later. We were going to do so much. I looked at them both, confused at how rushed everything seemed to be. Yes, and we will soon, Miranda said, leaning in to give me a kiss on the cheek. Don't feel you need to stay here, she shivered and looked round the room carefully before locking my eyes. You, you could find someone in town, you know, closer to the school. It, it might be safer. She turned to Jake and there was an awkward silence for a second. Uh, yes, uh, if that's what you want, he replied before receiving one of Miranda's disapproving glares. I mean, we could even help with moving and things if your brother isn't around. I can get a loan of a van, no problem, from the rugby club. I convinced him I was fine. I liked it here, and I don't had any nightmares, if that's what you meant. It was a cosy place when the fire was lit, so I wasn't moving anywhere. As I watched him drive off, I was left a little confused at their sudden departure, and wondered if maybe they'd just had a fight. The nightmare story that spun was just to keep their argument private, which I respected. I sighed and thought, ah well, I might as well tidy up the room, strip the bed, make the use of the day by doing a washing and getting the sheets out to dry. I don't know what it was, but I must have stood at that door a full minute before going in. Normally I loved going in there to sit at the window, especially when I was feeling low as I was then. However, it just felt, I can only describe it, as oppressive. The first thing I noticed was that the fire had not been lit, so I couldn't think what the flickering is that I'd seen last night. Maybe it was a mobile phone discarded on the bed during the fight. Maybe it was showing a video or something. I stripped the bed, all the time feeling eyes on me, staring, disapproving, angry with me for some reason. I started as I felt something pinch me on the shoulder, but there was nothing there. Imagination. I, I couldn't shake the bad feeling at all. So much so, I actually reversed out of the room, clutching the bundle of bedclothes all the while looking around at every corner. I swear, when I was closing the door, it was pulled from my hands and slammed shut, as though being told, finally, I was no longer welcome there. I couldn't sleep that night, all the while thinking of that room. On my way to bed, I had to pass the door and I was petrified. Why was I being so stupid? What if I needed the toilet in the middle of the night? I'd have to go past the door to get to the stairs to go down to the toilet. So I made a point not to drink for three hours before I went upstairs to bed. I awoke to the sound of someone moving around in the living room. Was it my imagination? No, no, there was someone moving about. What should I do? I got up, opened my bedroom door, and stared along the corridor to the spare room. The door was open. The house was silent. Hello? I called out, as though a burglar or murderer was going to reply. Perhaps they'd gotten in through the spare room window, which is why the door was open, and they'd gone downstairs to ransack the house. However, the sounds seemed to have stopped, and I could now imagine rustling coming from the spare room instead. Had they just gotten back into the spare room by the time I opened my door and were now climbing back out the window? I walked cautiously along the corridor to the open door. Hello? I called again. I didn't want to go into the room for any reason, so I just pushed the door open further. Nothing. At least nothing I could see. I went downstairs and looked around. The only thing I noticed was the main fire had gone out. I normally left it low backed up overnight, so in the morning all I needed to do was open it up, throw in a few more coals, and it fired up without any effort. I also kept the cold air off the room at night, and, as well as my bedroom above. However, 
He was definitely out, and the room felt freezing cold. While I was checking the kitchen, I heard a loud slam from upstairs and rushed to the corridor and looked upstairs. I didn't call out this time as the door to the upstairs room was now thoroughly closed. I crept up the stairs slowly and faced the door, took a deep breath, reached for the handle and turned it. It felt burning hot. When I went in, there was screaming, loud, horrible screaming. A young girl crouched by the fire, which was blazing. Slowly she stood and turned towards me. One side of her face so badly burned her hair was missing. Her mouth had no lips and her teeth shone red and bloody while her shoulder on that side had large clumps of flesh peeling off in torn red ribbons and dripped fire as it fell to the floor. She walked towards me, one arm outstretched. I stepped backwards involuntary, not sure if I was screaming myself and found myself back in the corridor. The door slammed shut in front of me and I left. I rushed downstairs, grabbed my coat, my keys, my phone. I left without looking back. I had no idea if the house was burning or not, but I wasn't looking and I wasn't going back to find out, ever. Following in the Footsteps by Catherine Bell It was that peaceful time of day. The time of day when it's too late to be called afternoon, but not late enough to be called night. There's a certain kind of stillness, perhaps an expectation almost. Certainly an expectation for those who are finishing their shift and making their way to the car park to begin the transition from working time to leisure time. As the sun dropped below the hillside, it wasn't yet dark enough for the streetlights to illuminate the cars that had been parked that morning by the now weary staff that made their return procession at the end of the day. Working in such an historic setting might be aesthetically pleasing for those who had the time to admire their surroundings. It certainly didn't make for a short walk to the car park. Historic was perhaps too grand a description for the Victorian hospital site. Prehistoric was a phrase sometimes muttered by staff whose day was interrupted by being stranded due to the temperamental lift mechanism. For a site that had borne witness to many thousands of patients over the years, it wasn't the interior of the buildings where staff were reluctant to walk the corridors alone. It was the hospital grounds, with the large mature trees that creaked and groaned in the wind, which caused the hairs on the back of your neck to prickle. In daylight hours, the trees looked majestic at all times of the year. Beech, oak, horse chestnut and sycamore. All shades of green in spring, and each laden with their own offering of nut until autumn arrived and the leaves turned. In winter, the branches looked like arms or claws reaching into the air, waving in the wind or cloaked in frosty clothing on days when the temperatures dropped. Under the canopy of these more ancient trees, the faster growing conifers swayed. Their evergreen leaves ensuring the sunlight never quite penetrated into every corner of the woodland, even on the sunniest of days. Small wonder that those with more vivid an imagination might easily conjure up darker imaginings from the light and shadows cast in the forest. Unfortunately for them, the shortcut to the car park cut through the wood. This was a journey that few were keen to undertake alone, especially in the winter months when the daylight hours were even shorter lived. On that particular day, the rain had been relentless. The usual soundtrack of birdsong seemed muted. Even they were finding little joy to the day. The wildlife that would normally be busily going about their winter preparations were also keeping undercover or underground. Even the sheep that could sometimes be found straying into the woodland were nowhere to be seen. During the day, the hustle and bustle of life within the buildings and adjacent to them still went on. Vehicles moved patients, laundry and supplies. The kitchen staff noisily prepared food 
their voices raised to be heard over the radio, blasting the latest pop hits. A similar scene of industry could be seen in the workshops and laundry that kept the everyday life of the hospital running. The only area that was unsurprisingly deserted was that of the gardens. The therapeutic benefit of horticulture outdoors outweighed by the torrential rain. For some, this was the end of the working day. Thoughts of appointments, clinic letters and emails were replaced by what to prepare for tea, watch on television or meeting up with friends, as well as whether the drains in the car park could cope with the deluge or whether it would mean paddling through two feet of water to reach their car. The routine of the hospital carried on. Meals were delivered, along with a trundle of medication trolleys around the wards. For one new member of staff named Alice, this would be their first night shift. Not wanting to risk arriving late, she found a recently vacated parking space and took time to prepare herself for the evening ahead. By now, the rain had finally stopped. Having checked that she had everything she would need for her shift, she locked the car door and began her walk across the car park and into the wood that would lead to the staff entrance for Aaron Ward. Having only previously made the journey in daylight, it seemed a very different place in the gloom of early evening. She was relieved when she saw a figure ahead who would hopefully be a fellow member of staff heading for the same building. Although it wasn't a long walk, she felt it would be easy to become disorientated and she was still concerned that she might arrive late. With thoughts of a reprimand on her first night shift, she hurried to catch up with her fellow employee. Strangely, it seemed that although she had quickened her pace, she didn't seem to be reducing the distance between herself and the figure. Shaking her head, she broke into more of a jogging pace and told herself that they were obviously just taking longer strides than she was. At last, she drew level, and although a little out of breath, managed to greet the person, who she now saw was a man. He was tall with a beard, and his hair was longer than the level of his shirt collar. He was smartly dressed, with a bow tie and waistcoat, as well as his sharply pressed suit. Thinking he was a doctor, she introduced herself and asked if he minded her walking with him. He nodded his agreement, and they continued on. Alice chattered on, asking which wards the man worked on, and whether he had been there very long. It seemed to her he was a person of few words, preferring to nod or shake his head, rather than enter into conversation. Feeling more than a little apprehensive as to what to expect on her first night's work, She didn't really give this behaviour much thought. She was more relieved of a companion for what would have been a cold, wet and dark journey. Nearing the edge of the wood, the lights of the hospital buildings were just about in sight. Alice turned to look up as the hoot of an owl broke into her latest question about whether the canteen would be open for the meal break of her shift. Turning her head back in anticipation of a reply to her question, she was confused to realise that the man was no longer there. Calculating it couldn't have been more than 10 seconds between her hearing the owl, looking up and then back down again, she was at a loss as to where he could have gone. There was no figure in front of her and he hadn't turned back the way they had come. Where on earth could he have gone? Looking at her watch, She saw that she couldn't spend any time, nor did she have any inclination in the gloominess of the wood, searching for him. She could hardly call his name, as he hadn't told her what it is. She would ask her colleagues when she reached the ward, although it would be a little tricky, since she only had a description, not a name, to go by. Reaching the staff entrance, she swiped her badge to unlock the doors. The buzz of the lock sounded and she pulled the door open. Light, heat and the sound of doors closing in the distance greeted her. It felt like she was entering an entirely different world to the one she had so recently left outside. 
The staff entrance had a short corridor to the locker room. Alice quickly changed into her uniform, making sure she had her ID badge and locker key safely tucked into her pocket. She exited the locker room and climbed the stairs that led to the ward. She smiled to herself as she looked at the portraits that lined the stairwell walls. Somebody in the hospital must have thought the wall would look similar to that of 10 Downing Street that displayed previous Prime Ministers. In the case of the hospital, it was previous physician superintendents from 1865 to 1954. Her smile froze as she recognised the face in a portrait from 1873 that she'd never seen before. Her companion on that evening's walk. The Weeping is a Huge Hound by Sebastian Taylor. The Weeping is a Huge Hound, a woman of great stature, tall and broad. Her face is gristle, and you can hear the pestle and mortar in her bones, in her joints. The Weeping smiles, though tears trickle through the crow's feet around her eyes. The weeping is a huge hound, and I haven't seen her for years. I haven't seen her for years, but she remains in every room, a hand on the moulding of every door. Calm Epi and the Key to Hell Calm Epi was often to be seen hawking her calm stains round the doors of St Andrews. The stains, yes, to whiten the steps in front of the houses, were popular amongst the maids. And they liked to see her coming as she was aye good for a laugh and a wee bit of gossip. But she had a dark side tea. Folk said she kent her thing or two about herbs and medicine. Aye, she could maybe cure your headache, but she could give you one too. They used to nudge each other and whisper a hand or horned. Do you think she's a witch? She was thought to have been born on a wild, stormy old year's night, just as the clock chimed twelve. Her mother was a fishwife, her father a fisherman. Drooned afore she was born. She was a canny bairn, hardly a whimper come out of her mouth. But after Mady, she turned into a screeching, yelling imp. The pair wifey struggled to look after her bairn. It wouldn't feed and it wouldn't sleep. And as time went by, she began to wonder if her ain bairn had maybe no been taken a wall by the wee folk. And this was a changeling she had, she had knew. If it was, she couldn't it was her ain fault, because she'd been in such a fankle that day in May, she'd forgotten to tuck in the bit of rowan and the limmer bead under the bairn's blanket afore she set about her work mending the nets. One day she got fierce gunner of the bairn's greeting. So she happed her in a blanket and left her in her crib and went for a wee donner along the shore to get some peace. While she was out, she fell in with a tall, good-looking laddie dressed in a long black jacket. They got to Bletherin and she told him her sorry tale. Well, did he no offer to help her to get her ain bairn back for the wee folk in return for a promise? A promise that the lassie would gan to work for him when she reached her 16th birthday. Thinking she was blethering with a real laird, Effie's mother agreed and the deal was struck. 
She was delighted to find that her ain Epi was back in the crib when she got back home. Well, mere time went by, and Epi's mother didn't think much more about it until the day of Epi's 16th birthday. They were just sitting down to sup their porridge when the door flew open and the laird strode in. This time, though, it was obvious that this was not just only laird, but the Earl of Hell himself. Epi's mother could do nothing as the lassie was carried off to be his servant. Well, she was hurt sear. She missed her epi. She didn't ken what to do. Near a year went by and word got around and reached the lugs of Lizzie McGill to Karen B, a wee old Kent's pay wife. Now it happened that this wifey was a distant cousin of Epi's feather and thinking she might be able to help, she sent word to Epi's mother to come and see her. Well, as soon as Epi's mother heard this, she flung on her jacket and her baits and set off to Karen B, getting there just as the Hogmanay celebrations were starting. By the time she'd had wished Obadi a good New Year and taken a drama and a bit of black bun and joined in a bit of singing and a bit of dancing, it was morning before they got a chance to talk. The spay wife was no long in finding a solution, though. She mixed a potion for rowan berries and herbs and put it in a wee bottle. Then she opened a kist and took out a muckle key. Now, she said, I want you to tack this key. They say it opens all the gates of hell. You'll find some of the gates in a cave along the coast just the far side of Enster. Open the gates, in the daytime, mind, and sit yourself down on a rock, just inside, and sing the lullaby you sang to Epi when she was a bairn. She'll come to you, and when she does, give her this wee bottle of potion. It's Epi's job down there to mark the calm stain for lime and clay, and use it to whiten the steps down into the earl of hell's lair. Tell her to mix this potion into the stain, and when she uses it on the steps, well, the deal will start to feel a bit uneasy, ill at ease. You'll not gain why, but you'll blame Epi and send her back. Epi's mother took the potion and the key and made her way to the Hell's Cave. Finding the gates there, she used the key to open them and then sat down on a muckle stain just inside and began to sing the bonny sang she had sung to Epi when she was wee. Sure enough, a four lang, Epi come running up the steps and into her mother's arms. She tell Epi what she had to do and afore the week was out, Epi was back home. Well, Epi continued to mark the calm stains and sent, started to sell them round about the toon. Some say she still adds a potion now and again. Maybe why they're so popular. And the key? Well... Epi kept it tied around her waist until the day she did. Some folks say she kept it just in case old Nick come back for her. But others say that she'd grown rather fond of him and she used it to visit every now and again. Just a whitey step. The day the deal came to Ochtern Mukti. By Margaret Bowman. This story was based on an old folklore tale 
well known in parts of Fife about the day the devil came and allegedly caused an uproar in the quiet and peaceful village of Ochtermachty. Centuries ago, when Ochtermachty was no more than just a hamlet of small thatched roof cottages and its inhabitants were good, God-fearing folks, there was a day when a stranger came into their lives and tested their faith. This small location had no place of worship of its own, so the congregation depended on travelling clergymen who would conduct their preaching from an outside central point. This irked the deal. He was livid when he heard these five folk followed the word of God, and he was then determined to tempt the villagers into the dark acts and lead more wanton ways of life. One day, a preacher came into Ochtermachty wearing a Presbyterian minister's attire and he was wrapped around in a long black cloak. He stood in the centre of the village and started to preach and soon enough he attracted quite a crowd who listened intently and became entranced by his captivating oration. As he continued, quite a following then surrounded him, inspired by this new minister's take on the ways of the world. While he was in full flow preaching to the crowd, a young man called Robin Ruthven came close to the front to listen. A sudden gust of wind came out of nowhere and blew around the edges of the black cloak and Robin could say that this minister had no feet. Instead, he saw a pair of cloven hoofs. Old Nick himself was standing delivering his own form of sermon in the midst of the good Fife people. Robin shouted out loud so everyone could hear him denouncing him as the evil fiend of all that was good, pointing out the cloven hoofs now visible under the cloak as the wind whistled and blew the edges higher. The deal was seething with rage in having been found out and made a gigantic leap onto the rooftop of the nearest house. As the crowd became angrier, he gave a thunderous roar, then burst into flames, bringing the nearby houses fully alight before disappearing. On rebuilding the township, the inhabitants selected not to use thatch, but to use pan tiles instead to protect their roofs from evil. It is also said that to this very day, it's difficult to get a resident of Mukti to heed the sermon, for they think that each sentence comes from one with a cloven foot. 1962 Poland Remembered in 2022 by Lilian Bzioska. Like the Ukrainians today, the Polish people know what it's like to be bombarded and invaded. I celebrate one of our Fife Rights members, Dr Lindsay Davidson, a musician, composer and music teacher. He lives near Krakow with his Polish wife and half Scottish Polish daughters. They have welcomed a Ukrainian refugee family to their Polish home. Such kindness as shown by many others from countries bordering Ukraine is deeply moving. I celebrate their generous spirited open heartedness. I have always found in my experience of the Polish people, both here and in Poland, also to be fine examples of human warm hearted generous behaviour, both in spirit and in sharing excellent tasty food even when there's very little to share. I too am half Polish, Scots daughter, though it's my father who was the Pole. My recently deceased mum, Ella Kennedy, MBE, learned to speak Polish to talk to our Polish relatives, who welcomed us all with open arms in the early 1960s when I was 10 years old. The Berlin Wall had been erected the year before my Polish granny and granddad's golden wedding anniversary. Despite the perceived danger, my dad drove us in a Bedford van 
all the way to Stadogard Gdansk in northern Poland, crossing the east-west border in Germany, the equally armed East German-Polish border, and through Russian-occupied Polish border towns. West German autobahns were amazingly modern for us, and the East German motorway was like a very long, run-down old airstrip, laced with weeds and punctuated by bombed flyovers. It was the first time my daddy had been back to Poland since the war. It had been 26 years since he had seen his parents. He sold his accordion and worked like crazy as a chimney sweep to make that journey possible for us all. My granddad met us at the Polish border. He looked like me. My mum's adopted family did not have this bone recognition. I could feel the difference. After one night in a military-controlled Polish hotel, Dad drove us through amazing forests and medieval peasant harvesting country scenes. Scythes were being used by long-skirted peasant women when we had combine harvesters in Scotland. Our van caused a stir wherever we went, as all the cars looked the same there. Dad drove through the night to arrive a day early at his mother's home to stop her being so wound up she might, at 82, have a heart attack with excitement at seeing her eldest son after so long. She was overjoyed to see us all. The journey there and back was epic. It's an intricate tale, too long to be told right now, of love, 80-year-olds full of life, and war-torn machine-gun closes. Russia occupied Poland as a trade-off organised by Churchill and the Allies after the Second World War. Her people were not consulted. The Catholic people were incorporated in the communist USSR overnight after being invaded in both directions during the war. Happy days! The authorities could have kept my dad from leaving Poland, as they did not acknowledge joint citizenship. My dad, Polish soldier in exile, Aloysius Konrad Bzowski, had naturalised and was known as Al Kennedy in Scotland. He loved his adopted country and his family. Kennedy had been my mother's name. They did not keep us. Celebrations were awesome. Food had been saved for months, bottled, pickled, frozen and fresh from the garden. Much rejoicing welcomed their real-life prodigal son and his family. Horses clip-clopped past the windows on their way to market. Rural life was policed by soldiers in uniform and undercover policemen were everywhere. The freedom song was heard as people gathered in churches all over the land preparing their raised hearts for the rise of solidarity many years later. When the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, I was on my way to a co-counselling international residential on the outskirts of London. Never had we imagined it would come down in our lifetime. Miracles were happening. Today, and every day since the invasion began, the Theosophical Society International are holding world peace meditations, focusing on the people of Ukraine and Russia, as well as surrounding areas. Mikhail Gorbachev and his wife belonged to the Theosophical Society and gathered Nicholas Rurik's mystical paintings in Moscow, as well as brokering Perestroika and Glasnost. Peace is always possible. One Saturday in March 2022, the Peace Poll folk who affirm peace prevailing on earth helped James Twynham broadcast on Zoom and Facebook, live streaming as he focused a worldwide peace meditation from Auschwitz. Thousands of people from every faith grouping participated and are continuing to hold their consciousness around the situation. 
Blessings and love to all our friends who are fielding the people most severely affected by Warmongers International blasting through President Putin and the Red Army for their own ends. Which bankers gain? Which oligarchs are paying Tories' wages? And whose weapons factories are supplying all the armies, pounding folk all around the world? The issue is aye the same. Peace will prevail when soldiers put down their weapons worldwide. People stop producing weapons and voting bullies into positions of power. Beloved be. I'm doing my best to keep breathing through my fury at the political madness into deep peace within. I know I would not be alive here today in Scotland if the Nazis had not invaded Poland. It's a miraculous world in which scythes will still sweep when the oil to run combine harvesters runs out. It would be good to be alive to see world peace landing. Hope springs eternal and miracles are always possible. This my father taught me. The Mindful Maiden by Catherine Home. Alone it sits beneath a tree, its emerald eyes scanning the place, with ever a hope that it will see another of its type and race. Its age unknown, its species rare, perhaps even less of its kind. It waits eternally right there, as though it has been left behind. With matted fur and canines long, it resembles half man, half dog, and yet it sings enchanting songs which cast a spell to bring thick fog. A maiden hears the haunting sound and tiptoes through the gloomy wood towards the creature on the ground who senses that her heart is good. She gathers berries, plants and seeds and drops them by the creature's hand. She watches as it quickly feeds and gasps as it begins to stand. Her offering transforms it to a noble prince who's dressed so fine. He approaches, smiles and says, Thank you, for eternity you will be mine. Horrified by this, the maiden flees. Blind in the fog, she slips and falls over the roots of rowan trees, oblivious to the prince's calls. She makes a wish amongst the roots. I've no desire to be kept. From the trunk reach out fresh shoots which cover her as if to protect. The prince arrives and sees the maid. He takes his sword. With his first blow, the rowan shoots shatter his blade and six feet into the air he's thrown. The maiden steps towards the prince. Are you okay? She asks sincere. He nods. I felt great ever since my fur and canines disappeared. But I know that it was wrong of me to expect that you would be my wife. Now that I'm human, honestly, I just want to live a life of experiences, some good, some bad, and relish in this new freedom. I wish to feel despair, pain, sad, and learn techniques to overcome. That's great to hear, and you're in luck. Take this gift, the maiden said. She handed him a hardback book. Keep it, it's one I've already read. Mindfulness, it's full of tips of how to live in the now and here. A smile spread on the prince's lips and the heavy fog then disappeared. Their future? Well, I cannot say. It's not something for me to state. We all need to find our way and be free to determine our own fate. The Cellar Dyke Sea Monster by Carl Harrington Millions of years ago, when the world was young, the ancient continent of Pangaea split. A monster that lived in the depths of the sea was trapped in the small body of water off the coast of Fife near what is now called Cellar Dyke. Who knows the origin of the monster? Was it a leviathan? the sea serpent described in the Old Testament, 
or the Kraken from Norse mythology encountered by the Vikings when pillaging Fife. The Vikings carved the monster's likeness on the bow of their longships to strike terror into their enemies and to protect themselves. Since that time, there have been regular sightings of this slimy cephalopod. Ancient manuscripts mention three black humps and four glowing lanterns that lure prey to the gaping mouth, resembling the luminescent organ of the anglerfish. Like a giant squid, it is covered with skin that manipulates light, camouflaging it against the surface of the ocean, making it almost invisible to the naked eye. Witnesses, those that have survived, describe large hollow black eyes and sharp tentacles that can slice flesh and bend the bars of a steel cage. Researchers have long wanted to study the monster, but no invention or contraption known to science could contain it. For many years, local fishermen had blamed the monster for destroying their lobster pots and tearing through their strong nets. Cellar Dyke is a place forgotten by time where primordial spirits lurk and things come out of the walls. Many believe that the locals swim in the tidal bathing pool to avoid being eaten by the monster. But the monster is not picky, since it also eats those tourists who scorn such superstitious nonsense. Usually, the monster dislikes attention. Yet, there is a story, which may be an urban myth, of a disbelieving visitor, an outsider who did not heed warnings. At the harbour bar, he foolishly asserted that the monster was a fake and that he would return to collect his wager after a quick swim in the sea, but the monster lured him with its glowing lights, the cold, slimy and razor-sharp green tentacles wrapping around his leg, dragging him under the waves. The massive black mouth swallowed him, leaving nothing but crimson clouds of blood and little for the rescue boat to discover the following day. That night, the northern lights appeared in the sky, and there were reported sightings of phantoms wandering the streets of Cellar Dyke. That wager still stands, although there have been more sober investigations. A young man, interested in conspiracy theories, even took a picture of the monster with his smartphone. The phone was discovered by a couple walking their dog, and whilst the screen was broken, it still contained a blurred image. The photo in the local newspaper was accompanied by the headline, Cellar Dyke Sea Monster Strikes Again. This was quickly dismissed by most readers as another Loch Ness story, but the young man's parents could not forget, and sparing of the police, contacted a private detective. The office of the detective in Edinburgh was shabby. A pile of papers and a brown mug sat on his desk, and a painting of African elephants hung on the wall. He was no Philip Marlowe, but he was their last hope. On a freezing January morning, with a cold biting frost, the detective drove his antique Morris Minor traveller from Edinburgh to Cellar Dyke. He felt like an outsider in this strange and isolated East Newark village. Interviewing locals about the disappearance, few were willing to pass the time of day, and of those that did, all blamed the monster. Moving from house to house, he thought how easy these fairy stories were believed by the simple fisher folk. He finally knocked on the door of a dilapidated cottage, which was opened by an old hippie with a grey beard, long discoloured hair, and traditional beads and sandals. Showing his identification, the detective said, I just want to ask you a few questions about the disappearance. The untidy cottage was covered in posters of aliens, flying saucers, crop circles, and standing stones. The hippie pulled down a scrapbook of newspaper clippings related to the monster 
adding in a conspiratorial voice that the sea monster eats them. He pointed to a pile of rubbish in the garden, explaining that this was driftwood left by the monster and picked up from the beach. The detective thought the hippie was clearly mad. The next interview only increased his conviction that the inhabitants of this forgotten corner of Fife were deluded. In a house further along lived a woman, considered by the locals to be a witch, but renowned for her tall tales, sitting in a room containing a carnival of mirrors and infused with the powerful smell of incense, the woman explained that she had seen the monster in her visions. Perhaps it is time to call it a day, the detective thought whilst walking back to the inn where he stayed. The rain poured down as he passed the harbour and saw yellow lights hovering beneath the surface. A car raced by, nearly hitting him as he moved out of the way. When he looked back, the dark waters had closed over and were lapping the side of the dock. At the inn, a folk band were playing loudly. An aristocratic looking man with wild hair, dressed in a thread worn jacket and baggy trousers, came into the bar greeting locals. Limping to the detective's table, he introduced himself as Lord Baldwin Smythe, the last of the Baldwin Smythes. He ordered a gin and tonic then slapped a wad of notes on the table, adding, You are to drop this investigation. It does not appear to be in the local interest. The detective ignored the money, and Baldwin Smythe sat down silently, with an angry red face, and finished his drink. He got up to leave, looked around, and put the money in his wallet. As he staggered out of the bar, he said menacingly, Watch your back, my boy. You should leave now. After taking his time over his pint of beer, the detective went to collect his key. He did not fail to observe that the receptionist had a tattoo of what appeared to be a green tentacled sea monster on his arm. Entering his room, he noticed a man in a brown raincoat outside his window with a mean-looking face. The man moved away when the light came on, and the detective thought no more about this, drying his clothes on the radiator and returning to bed. That night he experienced nightmares of glowing yellow lanterns and hollow black eyes. The next morning was cold and sunny, and to clear his head after the previous night, the detective walked through the village past a church with faded gravestones. Opening the heavy wooden door and sitting contemplatively in the pew, he noticed the minister had entered from the side. The minister had a look of concern on his face, and coming over he asked what troubled him. The detective told the minister of his investigation, and the taciturn and strange locals. The minister replied, The monster has taken my congregation, but old Captain Maddock can perhaps answer your questions. Maddock was the captain of a whaling vessel, and is said by some to have witnessed the creature. The captain lives on a boat by the harbour. Walking past the whalebone arches, the detective found the captain. He was smoking a pipe in a deck chair on his boat, trying to catch fish for dinner. He was wearing a yellow jacket, navy blue guernsey, and an old captain's hat. His left leg was missing. In its place was a wooden stump. The monster took my leg, he explained. Captain Maddock was a man of generous hospitality. He beckoned to another chair and poured a cup of tea with a dash or two of whiskey. Put hairs on your chest, lad, said the captain, grinning. He told his story about the day he witnessed the monster. He was returning in a stormy and rough sea from a whaling voyage in the Arctic. There were few creatures to hunt during those years, and many long hours had been spent scanning the horizon. The bosun thought he saw three black humps and yellow glowing lights beneath the water. The captain was convinced he saw a big creature covered in ancient barnacles, the glowing lights getting closer as it rocked the boat with its three black humps, attacking the ship with its tentacles. The sailors panicked and threw several harpoons, 
but its skin was like sheets of lead and the harpoons bounced off. The captain was knocked overboard and the creature retreated beneath the sea with harpoons sticking from its body. The captain was rescued by the crew but his leg remained in the monster's mouth. When the sailors returned to dry land, they had different versions of the story of this encounter. The captain finished his tale, stared meditatively out to sea and puffed his pipe. Back at the inn, the detective phoned a journalist planning to reveal his story, but there was a poor connection and he was unable to make contact. Outside the window of his room stood the man in the brown raincoat. The detective turned to lock the door. The next day the detective had vanished from the face of the earth. A few days later the captain was watching the harbour and saw yellow glowing lights moving under the water. There was a motorboat. It was dark but he could make out a couple of men in masks. They carried a bloody sack in the shape of a human body and promptly threw it overboard. The captain shouted after them, but they disappeared into the gloom as the boat chugged away into the night. Dark tentacles pulled the sack under the water as the glowing light sank beneath the surface. The captain reported the incident to the police, but they did not take it seriously, not from a man who insisted he had been attacked by a monster. The police did investigate the disappearance of a detective who had been seen asking questions in the village. Examination of his room at the inn revealed scratch marks on the floor, but the bed sheets had been changed and the lock on the door replaced. It was as if nothing had happened. A police boat searched the harbour, but the glowing shapes were explained away as reflections from the shore lights. A classified file, long since destroyed, pointed to the existence of a secret cult, members of which worship sea monsters as a sacred deity. It is possible that this cult occasionally kidnapped and sacrificed unsuspecting people, but no definite evidence was obtained to support such suspicions. Over the years, there have been many fanciful theories, often involving alternative dimensions, alien abductions and wormholes, but the case of the vanishing people remains unsolved. Perhaps there was a sea monster that pulled those who swam too far out to sea under the waves. Glowing lights are often seen moving beneath the waters of Cellar Dyke Harbour, and three black humps sometimes rise above the surface. Of course, it is easy to be deceived and such a monster might be mistaken for the Isle of May and its glowing lanterns for the reflection of the lighthouse. But don't dismiss all the stories you hear, or the cellar like sea monster may drag you down for its dinner. Finbar the Fearless and the Fairy Queen A Poem for Children by Margaret Bowman Finbar the Fearless liked walking in the dell he liked to dream there about plans for trees to fell, to open up the wood and create a clearing space. A great idea, thought Finbar, for the wood folk a disgrace. You just can't do this, Finbar, the old woodcutter said. I rely on the trees that I cut down to earn my daily bread. I fell them and plant anew to keep the cycle flowing. With no work left or trees to tend, I might as well be going. The wood is full of animals, so where will they now stay? I don't care, said Finbar, if I take their homes away. Their argument was overheard by a cheeky woodland sprite, who passed it on to the woodland elves who were passing by that night. He can't do that to our woodland friends, the dismayed elves replied. The fairy queen must be told of this, they fervently decried. The fairy queen was not amused. That bully will not win. We will stop him firmly in his tracks, 
his plan must not begin. The fairy queen sought out the rogue and faced him with his task. Finbar then got angry. This challenge will not last. He will push on with his plan, no matter what she said. These pesky fairies, get out my way or watch out where I tread. The fairy queen then whistled loud to gather up her clan. Out of the bushes and down from the trees, the woodland tribe all ran. Fairies, sprites, elves and dwarfs all gathered by her side. Animal friends from burrows all came running far and wide. You don't frighten me, Finbar yelled. I'm fearless, you well know. Oh, is that right, the fairy queen said. With her wand she drew out slow. A million fairies, bright shining lights flew fast round Finbar's head. He lashed out with his giant fists then fell down just like lead. Finbar had learned his lesson. His plan was torn asunder. The woodcutter and his woodland friends heard Finbar roar like thunder. You're truly beaten, Finbar, the fairy queen portends. Finbar's not so fearless now. That's where this legend ends. Walking stick by George McDermott I've got here an old walking stick, late 19th century. If you look at it, it's quite simple. It's got a slightly decorated wooden pommel, which has been more than fairly smooth through years of use. And there's nothing particularly impressive about it. However, when I first came across it in my grandfather's hall, this big entrance hall of his flat, I was intrigued. My grandfather was always telling me about things he had, saying, One day, George, this will be yours. Most of the time, it was books that he had, because on the inside front cover there was a page showing that it was awarded as a prize to George McDermott, which I thought was funny. I was named after him, so and it pleased him that all these would come to me one day as his namesake, his family elders. And I thought, this is great, I've got all these books with my name in them as prizes. But the walking stick, which he also promised would one day be mine, had a small brass plaque on it with the initials GW. And that wasn't me, and that wasn't him, so who was it? I hadn't realised that my grandfather was also named after his grandfather, but on his mother's side. And he had a middle name, my grandfather, which I didn't have. His full name was George Wade McDermott, his grandfather being George Wade. This walking stick, therefore, once belonged to my great-great-grandfather. And that was brilliant, because George Wade had this walking stick made specially for him, for a specific reason. And one day, I would become the custodian of this very special family heirloom. See, George Wade was a steam train driver for the North British Railway Company in the late 1800s. But, as a small boy hearing this was fantastic. My great great grandfather drove steam trains and I was named after him in a way. And I had in my possession his very walking stick. It's much better than books with my name in them. So he drove his trains up and down the east coast of Scotland and he moved to Edinburgh from Andros as a young man to work from Waverley Station. My grandfather said that the walking stick was made because of one particular night. 28th of December 1879, when he was driving his train from Edinburgh up to Dundee. By all accounts, and it's the news everywhere, it was a stormy, stormy night, the worst in living memory, perhaps the worst ever. Only one train was allowed onto the bridge at any one time to cross. George Wade passed the South Sydney, who gave the all clear and he ventured onto the bridge. According to the signalman's report, there was sparks seen flying from the wheels of the train as it struggled to keep its balance against the storm. And it wasn't long before the train disappeared completely out of sight into the gloom. Then it all went silent as a south signalman as the train crawled slowly 
but successfully to the other side. At last, the north signalman could signal for the next train to cross, and the next train started out just as my great-great-grandfather's had. Sparks again seen as the train fought with the wind, and soon it also disappeared into the gloom. The south signalman waited for the signal for the next train to cross. But he waited, and he waited, and sadly, that signal never, ever came. We all know now about the Tay Bridge disaster. That night the bridge collapsed and the train that fell into the Tay with the loss of all lives on board. My great-great-grandfather had missed being the driver of that train by a whisker and he was eternally grateful. Somehow, when the wreckage was pulled from the icy water, he was able to acquire one of the carriage knobs and he had it fashioned into a walking stick. It would serve as a reminder of how lucky he had been that night. And I now have that very walking stick, made with one of the actual carriage knobs from the very train that fell into the Tay all those years ago as the old bridge collapsed in a storm. So it's therefore not only a piece of my family history, but a piece of Scottish history as well. And I am so proud to be its current custodian. The Drakai. It was a broad sunny day and the tide was at its lowest, but Kate was bored and fed up as she donnered along the beach for the umpteenth time, absent-mindedly picking up chucky steeds as she went and throwing them into the waves. It was all very well being sent to bide with Granny for the summer when your wee and a hoose rich doon on the beach is exciting. But she was nearly a teenager now and needed her pals and a better Wi-Fi signal. She arrived at the dubs amongst the rocks at the far end of the beach and she picked up another couple of chucky stains and threw one into the nearest dub. Gas stains at me, would ye? What? said Kate, looking round to see where the voice had come from, dropping the stain she'd been about to throw back on the sand, right canny-like. Who said that? It was me, Dafty, said the voice. Who's me? asked Kate, puzzled, peering around. And what are you? Out here in the dub. Kate bent down and peered into the water. Her jaw dropped in amazement. There, sitting cross-legged in an upturned scallop shell, was the tiniest, ugliest wee crater she'd ever seen. Piercing blue een stared out from a slimy fringe, and tendrils of seaweed coiled round his misshapen body. What on earth are you? gasped Kate. Nothing on earth, actually, said the wee man. I'm a drakai. Any of the wee folk what bide in the water. Drakai? Water fairy? Ha! <laughs> My granny's a storyteller, and she kens awthing about the wee folk. She's telt me stories about fairies and brunies and pixies, but she's never mentioned that sort. Shows how much she kins then, doesn't it? There's hunters o' us living in watery hames under the sea and in burns and in lochs. And are they all as ugly as you? Any base at all, men, or I'll no gie you a chance to earn some extra bobbies for your pooch. Kate's in lit up. Extra bobbies? You mean like fairy goud? Something like that. Well, I didn't think I want any, said Kate. My granny says that there's aye a doon side to getting fairy goud. In fact, she said I should aye refuse because I'd just get myself into bother. 
نا 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 said the wee man. Your granny doesn't care or anything. That's the land fairies what get you in a bother. Our water fairies are I was good. We I keep her word. Well, said Kate, what was it exactly you wanted me to do? I just want you to lift me for this dub and take me back to the sea. How can you no walk like anybody else? Oh, our money questions. Because I'm a water fairy, a drakai, mind the clues in the name. I'm awfully good at swimming, but no so good at walking. Oh, right. So how did you get into the dub in the first place? Oh, the tide. You can. It comes in and it gans out. Well, I was out in my boat looking for pearls for my wife's birthday. And, well, I wasn't paying enough attention to the tide and I ended up stranded here. Can you not just wait for the tide to come in again? Nah, the sun's our head. I'll be burnt to a crisp by then. So could you possibly just move me, please? I'll give you one of my pearls. Well, I might have done. But you look awfully slimy and clarty. Just like uh, snorters. I don't think I want to touch you. Oh, oh please. I'm not that bad. Look, you didn't even hate to touch me. Just lift me in the shell. I'll give you twelve pearls. Oh, all right. Kate bent down and scooped up the shell and carried it at arm's length out of the sand to the water's edge. Well, here, do. Nah, nah. The waves will just wash me ashore again if you leave me here. You'll hit way do a bit. See that rook rock out there, if you tack me to that. Oh, impatiently, Kate kicked off her shin, gathered her skirt up to her knees and started to wade out to the rock. Wee waves lapping against her legs. When she reached the rock, she dropped the shell into the water, no too gently. Right, she demanded, where's my peril then? Here, said the drakai, reaching his horn out towards her. She grabbed at the peril, but as she did, his seaweed hair seemed to float away from his head, coiling itself round her wrist and her ankle. She felt herself being pulled into the water, and as it closed over her head, she heard a little voice laughing. <laughs> yes, she'd have listened to your granny. But that's not the end of the story. Seven years went by. Aye, seven years. And Kate's granny was walking along that same beach, like she'd done most days at low tide since Kate had disappeared. Always hopeful. This day, she spotted what looked like a heap of rags lying beside the rock. When she got close, she realised it was a young lassie with long, straggly hair and wild staring in. Kate! Oh, Katie, is it you? The lassie let herself be helped back to the cottage where she was dried off and put to bed, still clutching something in her hand. Over the course of the next few days, Kate, because it was her, gradually told her story. Tell how she'd been lured into the water by the fairy crater, thinking she would drown. But a bit of fairy magic meant that she found she could actually breathe under the water. She'd been taken to a cave deep below the waves at the bottom of a cliff. 
which was full of water fairies and hunters of babies. There she was given the job of housemaid to the wee man and his wee wife and nursemaid to the couple's crowd of wee fairy bairns. As each year passed, the water fairy gave Kate a pearl and when she had seven, the seven pearls she was clutching in her hand, they took her back to the shore and left her there. From then on, Kate never again told her story. Though she spent many a day wandering on the beach, gazing out to sea, sadness in her eyes, as if she was waiting for something or someone. But her granny was a storyteller, so she pinched the story and tell it to me. And now I've told it to you and you could tell it to whoever you like. The story of the Drakai. Which accused. Jagged like raven's wing, this harshness in the night. I am not your cause, fickle, not your martyr, not the carrion carrier of your disease, unease. Barbaric in Sunday best, you inflict harm upon what you do not, cannot understand. How much better to surrender with tenderness, to burn beneath a greater claim. My only fault was a want more than I could bear, seeking letters, stillness of the mind. By morning sun, my soul will vanish while your horrors haunt you here. Spell o' the Corby by Marian Berghaus Beneath tall trees find Corby feathers fower, then blaeberries twenty drook it fae a shower. A scraping o' pine bark, an ounce o' sticky sap, ain grey hair fae an old man's woollen cap. Twa sprigs o' juniper gathered fae a scree-sided hill. A toddy dram o' water stream sourced and chilled. A niff o' wild garlic and a spring sniff o' evening air. Add a wild mountain purple primrose picked we care. Twa sprinkles o' sparkle and stardust and a pinch o' yellow moon. Top up we a measure o' midnight, and stir we a muckle a silver spoon. Wrap in jute your ready potion, and secure we ribbons o' red. To the tranquillity o' Danino den, and pulpit rock your head. Finally, lure yourself a corby doon fae its rest and treetop nest. Put it gently. Gee three strokes, tae its puffed out feathered chest. As the clock strikes twelve, present yon pouch, past fae hand to beak. And richt fae your heart, true and loud, these words you'll hae to speak. Spell o' the corby a cast ye, at this cloudless full moon hour. This potion is for the heavens, carried we wings o' corby power. We ask ye rid o'er mother earth, o' human disregard and greed, and gie o'er bonny cherished land o' the love and care she needs. A Marriage Spell Poem by Margaret Bowman When sun goes down at end of day, tis time we witches make our play. Our cauldron heating on the fire, made ready for your heart's desire. A cupful thrice of river's life will base the mixture for a wife. Herbs and magic set the plan, then wisp of hair from desired man. 
Stir towards the heart and then add some petaled rose. And when the boiling brew begins to steam, add lavender to aid your dream. Let the mixture cool a while. Transfer it to a heart-shaped vial. Under your pillow let it rest for three more nights before you test. Place three drops above his head. Another three upon his spread. Wait three more nights, for you should see your suitor comes to marry thee. Forget-me-not spell. A slack rhyme given for all things riven. Poesy for freckle and golden ring until the stones around do sing. Love return and love go free. Bring my dearest home to me with chamomile and tears of newt, purple asparagus and soul of boot. Nothing far gone that once was had, when gathered the good, cast off the bad. Worshipped love one, a longing true, this verse in kind to wind and brew. Thank you.